So what I'm going to talk about today is how I've used this particular paper. Um, and first, I'd like to say thank you to the Marketplace team and also to Gary and Bethany for our little meeting last week. That helped a lot. And I also want to thank the students that aren't here but are listed on, on the paper. And this is what they've, uh, this is them and what they've come up with using this article. So here's the agenda, and I'll go through these slides first, uh, four groupings there pretty quickly, just to touch on all that. Um, maybe spend a little bit more time on the base simulation basics, that last point, the second to last point, simulation basics and, and some unresolved things. Um, and I was encouraged by the last presentation. Some of those may be covered in that. So deconstruct. So this is, again, this is the student's work. So critically taking apart, I wanted to emphasize that. This is what they get to do. And if one is very adventurous, they could go to uh, Destruction and Creation by John Boyd, which is from the 70s. I don't know if anybody's familiar with him, but he did a lot of uh, interesting work on uh, jet airplanes, the F-15, I think in the 16. So this idea of critically taking something apart. So they also learned here of 200 companies in the article that was sampled, only one in 10 really have a value proposition. I know my company, we have a value proposition. It's kind of um, opaque, but this is a, a, a method that con uh, makes this a concrete process. So here are the authors, uh, Payne and Fro. So, they, I think it's a, a very interesting article here. And this is the structuring of the process itself. How do you go about actually doing something? Okay, so they, in the article, they developed a, a process and the, the first step was finding who to actually deconstruct. So here's the criteria that they used, who to select, and in this, they link the value proposition to this idea of co-creation. And I've extended this idea of co-creation to the simulation as well, is what I present to the class. And this is, um, we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. So the exemplar, which I think uh, many people will be excited to see is not a Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 company, but it is a hospital. Shouldeis Hospital is located in Ontario, Canada, and specializes in hernia surgery. So for those, I think, uh, who are concerned about maybe wanting to do, I, I teach in a liberal arts college, um, so we don't necessarily want to do Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 companies. This is also an interesting path. Um, the YouTube video uh, is basically a marketing video, but uh, some of the interesting things that we can say for them as being an exemplar is for complication rates for this type of surgery, typically are one in 10. And at Shouldice, it's one in 200. So this gives the students where the data sources. So this is examples of all the data sources the, um, the students or the uh, researchers used. And the students, I find, are somewhat reluctant to use the library, but there is a wealth of, li uh, of library resources, especially for bicycle manufacturing and such uh, databases such as IBIS World, and right at their fingertips. So. Here's, of course, the typical research method. Okay, I don't need to spend too much time on that, as everybody knows, but this is something new to them. And here's the money shot. It's a little bit of an eye chart, but this is how they deconstructed it. So they go through the business systems and activities. So in this hospital, for example, you can go look and see, for example, diagnosis or post-operative service. And then at the top, this uh, idea of differentiators, what are they different from? So this idea gives the students an opportunity to also explore the competition because if you're an exemplar and a differentiator, you have to be doing something different. 
And then on the bottom, of course, are the cost drivers. So how much does it cost? And I think this kind of idea sets up well with the simulation. And we do this article, some of the groups present this right before uh, the simulation are pretty quick into it. So it gives them an additional framework. These are some of the pitfalls that the authors talk about, problems and issues with the exemplar, so nobody's perfect. So these are what they determined. And then about generalization and uh, application to other companies. Um, I think that's an interesting part too, because they also make a call for nonprofit companies and maybe NGOs. So I've also tried to use that for just not Fortune 100 or 500 companies, but also with nonprofits like the Red Cross or some, some other ones, but the generalizability to other companies. And this is a, an example that they use an insurance broker in the book or in the article, I'm sorry. So the student's conclusion gets us from a vague concept of a value proposition to actually how do we do one and how do we um, have differentiators in the marketplace. And like I said, I think that fits well. So I will just continue with the simulation basics, which I was very interested to, sh to show you. I always have started the course and ended the course with asking students kind of in a round robin fashion, not systematically, which I probably should be doing, but to talk about how they perceive life, um, whether it's a zero sum, zero sum game, winner take all, or it's a positive and negative sum game. And I do that at the beginning and also at the end. Um, I guess I've been very surprised at the answers. Um, I was hoping for a lot. I was very surprised that there's a lot of students that think uh, pick negative sum game or winner take all. So I think um, there's something to dig around in there. Um, this idea of co-creation, pain and fro, use it in the shoal dice example. I've used it in the um, example for the uh, conscious capital and bi capitalism bikes simulation. So this idea of co-production. So we're obtaining knowledge, you know, definitional knowledge, but we're also getting practical knowledge, this experience of where we're creating a community and supporting the class. And again, you know, whether it's, you know, people act differently if they think it's a winner take all versus a positive sum game. Maintenance, you know, they are teaching themselves a lot in this idea as well of co-promotion. So we all become an advocate for conscious capitalism um, however you want to define it, and there are many definitions. So here is an example that one of them actually tried to, one group actually tried to use that. And so I'll give you a second to look at that. I'm not going to spend that, but uh, too much time reading it, but it's just the idea of being able to define differentiators and also cost drivers. And a lot of this too would be um, their assessment over the course of the simulation when they're presenting their, their results. So I'll stick on that a little bit. And another way to look at it too would be this uh, quarter over quarter um, idea of the uh, differentiators over time. So you start off in the first quarter. So the, you're making trade-offs. So over the, I only ran six quarters last year, but if you ran seven, you know, how did you differentiate? What were the costs? And this is how they used it for brand evolution as well. And so, so here are some of the issues that I wanted to bring up about, um, I guess, I don't want to sell, I guess I'll say my reservations or my concern. And I kind of summarized it with a Jay Barney's resource based view article on rules for riches. This is all the way back to 2001, so it's been around, but I can let you read the quote. But it's this idea that certain actions will always lead to strategic advantage. And so there was a big argument back with, with uh, I guess, what, 20 years ago about this idea of rules for riches. And so I constantly um, get questions about that. Well, what do I need to do? You know, 
um, from the students, you know, how can, you know, so I'm excited about the career readiness aspect of it, but what do I need to do to get a, a good grade or whatever? So I put grading rubrics as examples of rules for riches. I put um, uh, maybe randomness and some other things in there too. Um, the idea of also learning to fail, I know we want them to be successful and I'm all for that too, but I also want to give them an opportunity uh, to be resilient or anti-fragile, if I could use that term, uh, Nassim Taleb, and have an opportunity to fail and recover. Some of that resiliency that I think I saw in the career readiness. And this idea of one right answer and how it's a focus on one right answer versus a trial and error and doing what if analysis, that seems to be a big hurdle to try to overcome in all the simulations. Um, and also dealing with an ambiguous environment. And a lot of, a lot of students don't have um, that experience. And I think this is a, a good uh, beginning. Anyway, the um, Rules for Riches article is in Academy of Management Review, Jay Barney in 2001. And I am recapping. So I kind of went through what the students had presented and a couple of the basics of how they've used it and also um, some of the unresolved questions. And I'm open to listening to comments or suggestions. And thank you.